Well, good morning. So it's a little hard to follow that. Um, it is a blessing to be here with you guys today, and um, we kind of wanted to show this video clip today because I think it illustrates something that um, a lot of us kind of take um, maybe for granted or we don't even pay attention to is the unseen realm um, that we have around us. Uh, it's so easy in our lives to focus on the physical things, the things we can see, touch, feel, and control. Uh, but there is a reality um, in this world um, that is unseen to us, that is really the greater reality if we're really honest with ourselves. And that reality imposes influence into what we can see, touch, and feel. And today we're going to be talking about the unseen things. Um, if you've been here the last few weeks, you know we've gone through this series called Believe. And this whole series has been around um, theology and learning the big picture um, concepts of, of the scriptures. And we've kind of systematically gone through different concepts week in and week out. And uh, today uh, we are going to be addressing those unseen things, the unseen reality, if you will. Um, I was reading this week, y'all know I'm kind of a little bit of a nerd, um, and there's more to that statement than just that, okay? I'm a little bit of a nerd, and I love to study um, statistics and research, and, um, and, and one of the things, uh, one of the great research groups out there for Christianity is Barna, and, and, and the Barna group back in 2009 uh, did a survey of people that profess to be Christians, and I'm going to read these to you, I want you to really listen because it's staggering. Um, if you really hear this research that they, they discovered, it said um, this particular uh, research project, this particular survey found that four out of ten Christians, that's 40% of people that proclaim to be Christians, strongly agree that Satan is not a living being, but is simply a symbol of evil. That he's a force. He's not necessarily a real living being. Um, in addition to that, two out of ten Christians, another 20% roughly, said that they agree somewhat with that perspective. perspective. <clears throat> and so already we have the majority of people proclaiming to be Christians saying that they don't necessarily believe that Satan, as the Bible describes him, is real, but that he's simply a force of evil. A minority of Christians indicated that they believe Satan is real by disagreeing with the statement. Only a quarter of them disagreed strongly, and only about a tenth of them disagreed somewhat. <clears throat> and the remaining 8% were not sure what they believe about the existence of Satan. Now, I'm going to think that might be the millennials. I don't know. I'm just I'm joking. Um, but you've got to land somewhere sometimes, right? But, 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 but those stats are staggering to me. That, that we, we can come to the place where we say we are followers of Christ, we are Christians, but we don't believe in this enemy called Satan. That the Bible is very clear on that he exists and that he is real and that he has an agenda and it's against you because you are a child of the king. And, and today what I want to do is talk to you today a little bit about uh, the idea of the unseen because it matters greatly. I, I thought it was really interesting. The same research, the same survey actually discovered that 90% of Christians do believe in angels, which is ironic, right? We want to believe in the things that are favorable, but the things that are unfavorable, we just say we're not going to believe in them, like that actually accomplishes something. I, I just think that's funny, right? It's like, it's, ah, yeah, yeah, you know, we don't have to see it, so it must not be real. Well, the problem is, if your eyes are like this, you're just a dead duck quicker, uh, because it doesn't change the reality of what's outside of you. Uh, and I think a lot of us <clears throat> excuse me, probably don't give a lot of thing, uh, thought to the unseen realm in our daily lives. Most of us, we go to a funeral and we hear you know, the preacher preach and we read the passages. We talk about eternity. We talk about being ushered into the presence of God. And, and we think about the unseen things then. Uh, we get close to Christmas time and we start reading the Christmas story and we hear about angels and we, we start thinking about the unseen realm then, or, or maybe we have a near-death experience and what should have killed us didn't. And we're like, man, something or someone must have been looking and watching over me, right? But what about the everyday things? Do we really give any credence 
to the reality that there is this unseen realm that has influence in our lives today. Well, I want to tell you there's two reasons that we're going to kind of talk about before we launch into this sermon that it matters what you believe about the unseen realm. And, and the first one we get from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In, 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 in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Jeff, I mean, I think Leon already read this, but he says this, Paul says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly realms. Paul's saying this to a church. He's saying, look, don't get wrapped up thinking that your problems are all on the surface. What you're really wrestling against in your lives goes deeper, and there's a sinister influence and an enemy behind it. And, and if you fight every battle at the surface level, you're never going to get free from some of the things you're facing. If you, and this has profound impact, right? This has a profound impact in how we relate to one another because you and I are prone to wrestle at the topical th level. That we're prone to kind of fight at the superficial level. And I want to tell you, if you fight at the superficial level, you will find yourself floundering again and again. Churches that fight at the superficial level and not at the level of the spiritual things will find themselves divided will find themselves in controversy, will find themselves uh, angry, will find themselves ineffective. Marriages, when, when you have a spouse and, and you come together and you think that everything is about the way they annoy you and that there's not some sinister, deeper influence trying to drive a wedge in there, you're going to miss and your marriage will suffer. Your children will suffer. It matters because we face a spiritual batter, battle behind all of these other things. Uh, the second reason it really matters is because uh, there's, a really, there's a very real enemy who wants to take us out. John 10.10, 10, Jesus is teaching and he says, The thief, he's talking about Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy you. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says this, there's a thief out there, and he has an agenda to steal, kill, and destroy. So when you're having trouble in your marriage, understand this, that there might be some things that you and her need to work on, but at the core, there's an enemy behind that saying, I desire to rip you apart. When your children are acting out, Understand that there's a, an influence of evil desiring to tear your children down. And that may sound like, man, Chris has just gone off his rocker. But I'm telling you, these are the words of Jesus himself. There's a thief. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. And he wants to destroy you. Let me tell you, we don't face an enemy that has a little red suit with a pitchfork that his greatest struggle in life is to get us to eat fatty foods right? We, we, we have an enemy in our lives, and he desires to destroy the people of God. He desires to wreak havoc in this world. He desires to steal joy. He, desi he desires to rob people of happiness and life that Christ can truly offer. And maybe you're out there today and go, Chris, I get that. I get that there's a, a war going on. I get that there's Satan. I get that there's angels. But at the end, does it really matter? Because God ultimately wins. Let me tell you, just because God has the victory in the end doesn't mean that your marriage won't be a casualty. Doesn't mean that your children won't be a casualty. Doesn't mean that your finances can't be a casualty. That your church, that your health, that your mental status can't be casualties in this battle. While you may have eternal life hereafter, you can easily forfeit the abundant life Christ offers today. It matters what you believe about the unseen realm. And today what I want to do is I want to kind of peel back the unseen realm a little bit by looking at some passages of Scripture to help us understand better how to engage this reality, how to, how to understand it, how to walk through it. And there's, there's three major truths that we're going to look at today as we kind of unfold this unseen reality. But these three truths, I believe, are essential if we're going to have a basic understanding and readiness to engage the enemy. Here's the first truth I want to give you today. If you'd like to take notes, take this down. First thing you need to know is that God is the creator of all 
things. I, you may go, what are you talking about? I want, you to, I want you to say it with me, okay? God is the creator of what? Of all things. Colossians 1.16, Paul writes this. I want you all to listen up. For by him, talking about Christ, he says, by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. You get it? Not just on earth, in heaven. Creation that's visible, right? So he says, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Y'all, this one is one of those that's going to have to get a little uncomfortable in here today, okay? Remember what I told you when we first started this series? If we will take all of our preconceived ideas and put them at the door and just let the Word of God speak, we can gain a lot of insight. Today's one of those days I'm going to challenge maybe some of your traditional beliefs on some things, okay? If God made all things visible and invisible, and they were all made through him and for him, then that means every principality, every power was made for the purpose of God. Tony Evans says it like this. Not that I don't love Tony Evans, right? I've got a, I love that dude. He says this. He goes, here's what we need to understand as believers in the world today. There is a devil out there who desires to steal, kill, and destroy, but above him is a God who owns that devil. He is God's devil. God created Satan. God created demons. God didn't say, well, I created all the good stuff, and I didn't see this other stuff coming. I don't know where this came up, because Colossians 1.16 says, all things were created by him, whether visible, invisible, thrones or dominions or rulers of authority. It's been created through him, and it's been created for him. Everything has been created for the express purpose that God intends. And that's so, so important. It's hard to parallel this really in our world today, but I want to give you an example of what I think this looks like. You and I, if you've ever built a house, you usually build a house for your purposes, right? That's why if you ever sat down with an architect or a designer and you're looking at building the house, right? Most of y'all in this room, if you've ever built a house or remodeled a house, you don't paint it colors that I would like, right? You paint it colors you would like. You don't design closets like I want. You design closets like you want. You might want a garage. I might want a carport. But here at the end of the day, if it's your house, you create it and design it specifically to meet the the needs and the desires that you have. This is what Paul's saying in Colossians 1, that this whole universe and all the unseen things as well has been designed by God for a purpose, and I don't always fully understand that purpose because if I believe that God created all things, then I'm going to have to say then it must be true that even the things that, that are done that are evil are still in God's design to accomplish God's purposes. Now, here, here's where I'm going to lose you, right? I'm not saying that God is the originator of evil. What I'm saying is God is big enough to somehow create beings who have free will, who do bad things, and do evil things, and God is still ruling over them sovereignly to accomplish God's purpose even in the bad things. And you might be like, Chris, I'm uncomfortable with that, but you're really not uncomfortable with that. Let me prove it to you. This same principle is what we see on the cross of Calvary, right? Everyone in this room goes, man, I love the fact that God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for my sins, right? That's a very good thing, and that's very much the plan and the purpose of God. But for God to accomplish that purpose, do you realize some very evil people had to do some very evil things to bring Jesus to the place of crucifixion? And in the Old Testament, we see that it pleased God to crush Jesus on the cross. That's actually the language. It pleased the Father to crush him. So here's what you need to understand. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, it was the Father nailing him to the cross while evil people did the work. Will Chris explain how that happens? I don't know. And here's the thing. I'm content going, if God created all things, then God is truly 
in control. And even though there may be some, quote, bad things happening, I trust that God is sovereign enough to direct those things to his purposes in the end. And that's where we've got to get, because if we start believing that only the good things I see in life are under the direction of God, then I'm going to get discouraged. I'm going to get uh, distracted. I'm going to get lost, and I'm going to begin to wonder and waver and and begin to shake when the world begins to get difficult, because I'm going to forget that this world, the unseen realm, is not something where God's here and Satan's here. God is up God is over. God is sovereign. Satan can do nothing to you that God does not allow. Read the book of Job. Read the Old Testament. Read the New Testament. It's all throughout the scriptures that nothing comes to us that God does not somehow allow and bring into our life. You might say, well, Chris, I don't think God does this to this degree. We can argue about degrees all day long, but I'm just going to tell you at the end of the day, we serve a God who is bigger, and even the devil is under his direction divinely for finality. He, he, he is in control. God is not out of control with Satan, and we need to understand that truth. We don't have to understand how it works, I'm not going to understand how it puts together, how he puts it together, but I have to believe it's true because the word teaches it. The second truth you need to know if you're going to engage in this invisible realm is number two is the world is at war. I want you to hear me. The world's at war throughout Scripture. We see angels doing the bidding of God. We see them coming along and assisting God's people. We see them sitting around the throne of heaven saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But there's this other side of the equation. There's there's this enemy of God called Satan, and, and who is he, and, and what is he about? Well, in Isaiah chapter 14, and even in Ezekiel 28, we get a picture into who the adversary really is. And I want to kind of, this is going to be a teaching time, so please stay with me right now. In Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah is prophesying against the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon is going to be judged because of his wickedness. In Ezekiel chapter 28, the king of Tyre is going to be judged because of his wickedness. But in that passage, both the prophets begin to talk about the, the evil that's influencing the kings. And they go beyond the physical king, and they start describing something in the supernatural world. And you can see it in the verbiage, because some of this doesn't make sense if it's just the king of Babylon or just the king of Tyre. And in Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah describes this fallen creature, and he says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. Now, the word star is capitalized right there, and throughout the scriptures, you're going to see the word star equated with angelic beings. You'll see it through Revelation. You see it in Daniel. You see it in all the Old Testament prophecy that stars and angels are kind of connected. And he says, how you are cut down to the ground, who, you who laid the nations low, you said in your heart, I will send to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Most scholars will tell you this is a reference to something that was happening in the unseen realm. This is the fall of Lucifer, who we know as Satan now. And he's saying what happened was one day Satan decided to lead a rebellion because he wanted to be above the God most high. And he began to elevate himself, but he was an angel who was created, and he was high-ranking, and he evidently decided to lead this rebellion against God. And he began to fight against the people of God and the things of God. And even when we look over in Revelation chapter 12, we begin to see more of this imagery. It says in verse 3 of Revelation chapter 12, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. Now follow me. Look down at Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. It says, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. 
Now, y'all follow me right here. Here's what most scholars would agree, and I agree as well. What's happening is a great war in heaven broke out. And the angels rebelled, and Satan, or Lucifer, was the ringleader. And about a third of the angelic host went with him. And God, through his archangel Michael, kicks them out of heaven, and he cast them down where? To the earth. Do you realize that in the first two chapters of Genesis, you have that all things that were created were good? It's only in Genesis chapter 3 that things begin to take a turn. Why is that? Because somewhere between chapter 2 and chapter 3, this happens. And Satan is cast down to the earth. And now he roams around as a serpent in the Garden of Eden to tempt Adam and Eve. Do you realize when, when, the, when the earth is pronounced good, or when heaven and you have paradise again, do you know when you get that again in the scriptures? The last two chapters of Revelation. The entire story of the scripture is Satan coming to the earth wreaking havoc, God bringing redemption through his son Jesus Christ and conquering Satan once and for all and kicking him out into the lake of fire at the end. That's the progression of the scriptures. But Satan is all throughout the scriptures, all the way from Genesis, all the way to Revelation. We see Lucifer and his angels. And what we see him as in scripture later on is we see him as Satan, the deceiver. And he's accompanied not by, quote, angels, but who? Demons. So when people say, man, your kid, they're such an angel, that could cut both ways, right? Because some angels are now demons, right? And if you've ever worked our pre-K ministry here, you get what I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> telling you what, I'm coaching little dribblers for little girls right now. Woo, I'm telling you, there's some angels out there, all right. I'm... But the world is at war. And why do I want to hammer that so hard is this, is because there's the battlefield that is being fought upon is not for control of the physical world, but it's for the hearts of those made in the likeness and the image of God. Follow me. Who has been made in the likeness and the image of God? Humanity. And now Satan has been cast down. And his desire is to destroy anybody that bears the image of the one that booted him out to begin with. You see, the unseen realm is a powerful influence in the world today. Satan roams around the earth. We're, we're told at one point he's roaming to and fro looking for just to wreak havoc somewhere because he and his minions are at war against the God of heaven. And they don't have the authority to really fight against the angels right now. So where they're doing is they're on the battlefield of the hearts of God's image bearers. And it matters that we understand the world's at war because if there is a war going on, we better be sure that we're aware of it. Can you imagine that your country's at war? How foolish would it be just to go ride your bicycle like bombs aren't dropping? How foolish would it be just to go take a walk like there's not snipers in the woods? I mean, how foolish would it be? We would say that you're insane if there was a physical war going on. We would say you're insane to just meander through the streets like nothing's happening. But according to Barna, 60% of people who claim to be Christians are strolling around like there's nothing going on in the unseen world. And we wonder why the divorce rate is just as high in Christians as it is in unbelievers. We wonder why kids are, are being lost to drugs and pornography. We wonder why homes are being broken apart. We wonder why churches can't get along. Could it be that we're acting as if we're all just physically can't get along? But what's really happening is there's an enemy underneath trying to tear us apart. Could that be the truth? I think it is because we are in a world at war. Let me tell you guys, young men in the house, listen to me. When, when, when you're tempted to just take that look, click that thing on the internet, it's not just to give you a little high to make you feel a little guilty. There is a sinister plot to deplete your soul. And he wants to rob you of joy. He wants to rob you of purpose. He wants to rob you of value in the kingdom of God. Let me tell you, there's a great war going on. And the more we ignore it, the more we ignore it at our own peril. If you're looking at your life right now going, I don't know what's going on. Things are just falling apart. Let me tell you, there is someone who is after you. And his desire is not just to make your day a little uncomfortable. His desire is not just to make you a little unhappy. His desire is truly to take you as an image bearer of God and destroy you. 
And I don't know about you, but when I start thinking about there's someone out to destroy me, there's someone out to destroy my family, there's someone that wants to destroy my marriage, then when I see those things on the surface that threaten my marriage or threaten my, my testimony or threaten whatever, I see a little deeper. And you need to see a little deeper because we are at war in this world. Well, I don't want to depress you. I don't want to make you sad. I don't want to make you feel bad about that because here's the third truth that you need to know, and this is the mighty truth, is that God will be victorious. I want you to hear me. God will be victorious. With all the spiritual warfare going on, there's oftentimes fear in the hearts of people, but we're told over and over and over in the Scriptures, do not fear. There's a passage in Matthew that kind of, I think, gives us a reason to celebrate and rejoice. Uh, Jesus is coming along, and he's in this area called the Gadarenes, and uh, he comes to these demon-possessed men. And in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, it says, When he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him. And coming out of the tomb, so fierce that no one could pass by. So, so, so these guys are controlling the road in this area. And, and, and so Jesus comes up, and it says, Behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Can I just stop there? Do you not find it staggering that, that the one group of people who never missed who the Son of God was, was the demons? They didn't. They, they always knew who he was. We're told in James, the demons believe that there is one God, and they shudder. Why? Because they know their fate is sealed. And, and here's what they say. Behold, they cried out, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us, underline this, before the time? Some of your passages, some of your translations will say before the appointed time. Get this. The demons know that they have an appointment with judgment one day. They know that their time is limited here. They know that this is just a passing time. And they know that one day they will have a reckoning with their creator. And for now, they're roaming around wreaking havoc trying to destroy homes, trying to destroy families. But in the end, they know their time is limited. And in Revelation chapter 20, we kind of get a picture of what that time looks like. In verse 9, it says, And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Here's a little nuance I'm going to give you. You ever hear somebody pray, God, send fire from heaven? You never want God sending fire from heaven on you, okay? It's never a good thing in the Bible. Um, it's, it's really not. Like, you know, it's, it's really not. So fire comes down from heaven and consumes them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20, right before the end of the book, says, God will be victorious. I know in Genesis 3 he came on the scene. And I know for thousands of years he wreaked havoc. But you need to be confident of this. God is accomplishing his purpose with that enemy all throughout human history. And in the end, God will take care of that adversary. And he will throw him out and cast him into the lake of fire. He will handle the adversary. He will be victorious. And I'm going to tell you, it's hard sometimes to face hard times. It's, it's hard to face the challenges we face when we're at a world, when we live in a world at war. But it's a lot easier when you know the end of the story. It's a lot easier to sacrifice if you truly believe the end of the story. Y'all ever watch a movie or read a book? And man, it's just got this moment where it's just, it's tough, it's hard. Someone's struggling with sickness or someone dies and Man, I'm just a blubbering mess, right? You know, you're ugly cry. You know what I'm talking about, right? You're not just tearing up. I mean, like, you're embarrassing yourself, right? Have y'all ever done that at a movie, right? Some of you guys, no, I haven't, except old yeller, you know, or whatever. But, you know, why do they show where the red fern grows in schools? That's horrible. Like, I mean, come on. 
No wonder kids are struggling, right? Golly, you had to kill them. Couldn't you have made them just hurt a little bit and limp? I mean, golly. Um, but, but it's just heart-wrenching, and you're struggling through the story, through the narrative. You're just struggling. But then, but then you watch the rest of the movie, except where the red fern grows. This doesn't work for this movie. But you watch the rest of it, and you realize that, that there's something good on the other side. And then you watch the movie again, and, and you kind of still cry through that part. But pretty soon you stop crying through that part. You know why? Because you know the end of the story. Guys, the beautiful thing about living in 2022, when people are like, oh, the world's just so bad. I'm so thankful we get to live on this side of the cross. How blessed are we to be able to live with the full narrative of the Scripture with the Holy Spirit indwelling us, that we don't have to look like Abraham and looking ahead and going, I don't have a clue what's going on, but I believe him. Like, right, I mean, I cannot imagine being an Old Testament figure and going, I have no clue what we're talking about. I'm just supposed to believe in him, and I'm going to do that, but I don't know the story. But we're sitting here reading the first part of the story to the end. We're reading the story that hasn't even happened yet on our side. But that shouldn't cause panic for us that should cause joy. That should cause steadfastness. That should cause hope. That should cause resolve. Because we look to the end of the story and go, you know what? There's a day where the enemy will be taken care of. And there is a day that what is wrong will be made right. And there's a God who is over all of it. And even the unseen things and even the things I can't understand, I can trust this God because he will be victorious. We shouldn't fear when we see calamities in the world. We shouldn't fear just because we see the influence of Satan. We should recognize it, and we should buffet against it in the power of God. So the question is, what are we to do in response to a sermon like this today? Let me get Chris to come up with you musicians, and y'all are so excited because I'm early today, man. Y'all can say amen to that, right? Um, but when you, but this is such a teaching sermon that I was like, what? what's the response? Like, what do we do with what we've heard? Well, there's a passage there in Revelation chapter 12 in verse 10 that I think will help us know what to do. It says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Get this, though. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. He says, you want to know how you fight against this adversary? You fight it by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't fight it in your own strength. Let me tell you, like, Satan is very powerful. And I hear people that pray things like, I come against you. I don't come against you. The blood of Jesus has conquered him. And I come as a recipient of that blood and that sacrifice, knowing that I have the full authority and the power of the God of heaven behind me. You see, the way we come and we buffet against this world of evil is in the power of the blood and the word of our testimony. There's power in the testimony of what God has done. Such power. If you don't believe it, I challenge you to go in a neighborhood one night, a dark place, and begin to tell people what Jesus has done for you, and you will begin to see some of the unseen things come out as Satan buffets against it because he cannot stand the testimony of the gospel. He can't stand it. Because it's just a reminder that his fate is sealed. And he has no real authority of his own. Because there's a God in heaven far above. He is a created being and he will be dealt with. So, so, so how do we respond? Well, well, one, if you're a child of God already, Take serious that you're in battle. Start seeing bit beyond your frustrations around you. 
No, you, I'm good, Siri. Thank you. Start seeing beyond the frustrations to what really may be going on. But, but here's the second one. I want to make sure you hear this. If you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm not trying to scare you. But you were already on the side of the enemy. And the only way you find victory is by being covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, here's what I'm talking about. Jesus came. He died on the cross, shed his blood because you and I are sinners. And sin requires a payment. And that payment is death and shed blood. So Jesus shed his blood so that it could cover our sin so that we could be made right with the God of heaven. And it's that power that conquers hell. We'll still deal with some of the, the craziness of him ro- running around this world and roaming. it. We'll still have to deal with some of the f- influence of evil. But we can know with certainty that we have victory in the end if we are covered under the blood of Jesus. So that's the call today. Have you accepted that gift of salvation that God has made possible through the work of Jesus? Have have you accepted that? If you're like, Chris, I'm really not sure. Can I be honest with you? There's not a more important question for you to get the answer to than that one today. Maybe you're out there and you're like, oh, I've been fighting, trying to struggle, trying to get this done and get that done. My wife and I, we just can't get on the same page. My husband and I, let me tell you, can, can, what if you just submitted it to the Word of God and said, God, we're just going to do it your way. And we're going to believe in the power of your Word. And we're going to submit our lives under you. And we're going to trust you that you're able to accomplish what we cannot do on our own. There is a spiritual war and there is an enemy out to get you. But there is a God who will walk with you through it all if you will ask him, if you will cry out to him. So let's stand and let's sing and let's just worship this God and let's just praise him for just being a victorious God. And if God has moved and impressed upon you that you need to come to this altar and pray, come talk to me, I'd love to. Do business right where you are. Just don't let today go by without doing business with God. Let's sing.